Well, hello. Hello, hello, everyone. And welcome to the future of storytelling. Uh, I'm Ryan Clements, one of your hosts. First of all, OK, I assume my mic is on, because you can all hear me, correct? First of all, give yourselves a round of applause for not leaving. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Um, I have the, uh, first of all, I have two qu uh, comments for our production team. The clock still says zero, so we might want to reset that. And also, someone stole my notes. And that's a shame, because I had all my questions here. So maybe someone can <laughs> run that up to me at some point during the production. But I want to first introduce uh, the incredible developers that are sitting here up with me. Anyone that has played a great game with a great story knows how important story is in games. And I am very honored to be here with some of the folks uh, behind some of these great games. So first of all, we have Corey from Santa Monica Studio. You might know him from such games as God of War. Corey, thank you so much for being here. I also have Genova Chen from That Game Company. A little game called Journey is very good. And also Kareem Etune from uh, Media Molecule. You might know them from, you know, Little Big Planet, Dreams. And on the end, who may or may not have to use a stick mic at some point because you shorted out your microphone somehow. Greg Kasavin from Supergiant Games, Bastion Transistor. Formerly a game editor like myself. I, I came from a different walk of life. My last name because you thought you screwed up. Yeah, so uh, Corey jokes a lot because his last name is Balrog. But the, no, wait. Huh. See, you even see, I did it. Now. It happened. No, <laughs> Balrog is the name of a mythical beast from Lord of the Rings. His real name is Barlog, and I messed it up, but you can all make fun of me later. That's right. Uh, anyway, I still don't have my notes, but at least the timer is working, so that's good. So, anyway, I want to just start uh, a little bit with Act One of our show, Inspiration. So, what I want to do is talk to these gentlemen up here about storytelling from their childhood and growing up, because obviously uh, any writer, any artist usually drives inspiration and you know, gets something from their childhood and from early walks of life. So Corey, I think as the person on my right, you get the distinct pleasure of starting us off. Fantastic. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you when you were growing up, especially when it comes to the realm of video games. Mm, uh, this is it, you're on the spot. Yeah, I know. When I was a kid, uh, what is the first story that uh, I was read? Uh, everybody poops. <laughs> So God of War was inspired so by So it was inspiring uh, a lot of my uh, future work, according to some people. Um, Surprisingly, I had the same thing. Like, my team member always like, why are you always making a game about eating and pooping? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We need if you to think about all the game, game I'm I think making. that's what they're saying. Yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, I, actually, as not, not as a young kid, but uh, when I was in middle school, I read Ender's Game. And Ooh. that book really kind of drew me into the concept of really good storytelling. Uh, so I would say that one. But, but interesting that you know, science fiction drove you, and then you worked so hard in fantasy storytelling and stuff as well. So did you ever find that those two you know, were at odds with each other, or do they, is it all the same? Not really. I mean, well, it, at the end, you want to find the, the sort of human connection to any story. So science fiction, fantasy, drama, anything, it's all kind of generally the same thing. Yeah. Genova, so besides also Everybody Poops, right. what, everybody ins poops. <laughs> what inspired you uh, when you were growing up? Uh, I think when we talk about story, I keep getting mixed between word building and uh, narrative building. And they bo they're both story. I mean, with talking, it's all the, the fantastical word that makes me want to live in. Like, I have a lot of desire, you know, growing up reading different fantasies and swordsman novels dreaming about me being that word. Um, but as I grow older, I start to like more about a character's development, you know, a person's transformation that really touches me somehow. Uh, a strong story could move me to tears, and it's, it doesn't really necessarily matter whether it's in a sci-fi or a fantasy world. It's more like what happened to the person and the choice they make, and they are very interesting. Because when I read a good story, I start to think, like, should I? live my life according to how this character uh, choose certain value. I mean, it makes me think and it makes me feel like I, I grew, grew up to be a more mature person while thinking about the character development uh, in these fiction situations. Mm. Wonderful. What about you, Kareem? Well, I started, I've, I'm, I'm an artist, and uh, the, the, my angle was 
comics. I always wanted to be a comic artist, uh, to do graphic novels. I, I connect to the moment, the visual, the setting, the intrigue. And some of my earliest memories was Jungle Book. I love Jungle Book. Just like the lingering story, not much going on, but lots of connection with that world. And uh, the, the, for me, uh, the, the anchor for story is uh, moments that intrigue me and make me want to find out more about that world and that universe. This is always iconic. I love the word intrigue, and I've always like, when I watch something that inspires me, I sort of uh, get uh, captivated by it. I draw it, I respond to the characters and uh, the feelings in, in, in it. And I, when I was a kid, I would impersonate the, the characters for a week. It's a week of being Batman or something. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, it's always the visuals, always the intrigue is my launching point. And would, would you say that specifically is what brought you into the video game space as well? The video games was about, because my, my, my training is uh, in architecture and, and uh, interior design. And then I uh, specialized in cinema, set design for film and theater. Games for me was that, but the fantastical version, like the, mm -hmm. the, the ability to make worlds and characters and go to places that the real world uh, uh, can't. So, so the, 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 what attracted me in games was to, to be able to tell stories and create worlds that aren't possible uh, anywhere else. Hmm. How about you, Greg? Let's see if your mic works, first of all. Do a Let's mic see. check. Let's yes. See Can you hear Greg, everyone? Yeah. All right. Good. So I, I, have, I have a couple questions for you about your inspirations. Yeah. But still, how about growing up, though? Like, what, what inspired you in your writing style? Yeah. I. Um, I always loved reading and writing just in general as that, that kind of kid, but uh, I, I would say I loved video games even more. It's kind of, I'm, I'm the sort of person who's been playing games from my earliest memories, just kind of reaching up for arcade controls and stuff when I was like four or five. Um, and I played a lot of computer games also, so I'd been playing them all along, but it was really at, at around the age of eight when I played a game called Ultima 4, which is a classic role-playing game. Ooh. Uh, Ultima yeah. fan, I heard a smattering of yeah, applause. Yeah, it's <laughs> you know, Ultima's pretty old at this point. So, <laughs> but um, but it's like if you're if you're into you know if you're playing like Fallout 4 or something right now these days, it, it, it any any big sprawling role playing game owes a lot to the classic Ultima games at this point. And these games were my first exposure to just kind of the the raw like power of video games. It was just crazy that I was. In, in this world and able to affect it in such a profound way and that the, the moral choices were, were for me to make and the, con uh, you know, the game didn't judge me, it just presented the consequences of my actions to me. And at the age of eight or nine, it was like, man, this is heavy stuff. Um, and it, it just not only uh, it kind of broadened my horizons as far as what, what, what games could do, but also what stories could do and, and mechanically the game was really fascinating as well. So for me, it was kind of the whole the whole thing summed up, and I, I knew that human beings made this, uh, in fact, a small number, uh, and I'm like, I don't know how this was done, but I want to do this someday. Yeah, and you made a very unique, well, maybe not super unique, but a unique leap from games writing, where you were writing about games and critiquing and previewing into you know, actually writing scripts and working on games for yourself, and how, how was that leap for you? I'm sure you've talked about it countless times, but just give, give it to us again. No, yeah, so I used to, um, prior to getting into game development, I worked in the gaming press for a long time, for like uh, 10 or 12 years, um, uh, particularly at GameSpot. The, this, was, this was almost 10 years ago at this point. Um, I left back in 2007, and I really uh, fell in love with writing about games. I had no real competency as a programmer when I, I'm like, you make games by coding, and then I try to do that, and it didn't, didn't take so well, but I knew I had to do something with games, and, and that ended up being writing about them and try, trying to kind of understand them critically. Um, but my, my, I guess my sort of underlying desire to always work on them and just to have this more kind of creative impulse around wanting to make stories and make characters and so on, that uh, it's an itch that uh, writing game reviews and stuff uh, ultimately does not scratch entirely. Uh, so yeah, I, I you know finally the opportunity presented itself. Excellent. By the way, you guys can like inter you, you can ask each other questions too. I, I don't have question. to be the only one. I'm always the guy with the question. Uh, <laughs> so 
you mentioned when you were eight years old, it was a you know kind of mind blowing experience yeah. playing Ultima Four. I remember playing Ultima Four probably when I'm like I mean, twelve or something. I don't know. I don't remember exact age, but yeah, it was a really really powerful experience. But I, if I play Fallout Four today. That experience kind of become blurry. Like my nerve seems to develop some kind of uh, defense system. I'm I'm not easily blown away anymore. Yeah. Um, but do you think if eight years old play Fallout 4, is it going to be more intense than Ultima 4 for you back then, or is it going to be less I, because I, there's so many game out there? Oh, I, so I've thought a lot about this. I I think for sure that when someone kind of encounters the right kind of work of media at the right point in their lives, it has that effect on them. So, so I, I for sure think that Fallout 4 is going to be that game for someone out there or whatever, probably for a lot of people considering how well it's doing. Um, and, uh, you know, Bloodborne is probably that game. Like, a lot of different games can provide that for, mm -hmm. for different people depending on what um, kind of sparks their imagination. The other thing I found interesting is like Peter Jackson just used to say, you know, the, the reason he des decided to jump, you know, jump in to make films was because when he was nine years old, he watched King Kong, which he's not supposed to watch, but yeah. he was blown away. He's like, he can't believe how, you know, magical it is. He just wanted to do that. Eventually he made King Kong, right? And I, I, I'm just noticing like a lot of these people, they make these like lifelong choices because they were blown away by something, you know, before they become like, you know, cynical teenager, right? Like, what's what's happening with that? Why can't we only be touched at that age? You know, I, I think you've had fewer experiences to to compare against. It's 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 just more formative because you have fewer things like that to to compare. Uh, that's that's my suspicion anyway. I mean, there have been a lot of really amazing role playing. You know, I've continued to play role playing games my my whole life for like the next thirty years or whatever. And yeah, it's I think it's understandable that. A role-playing game I play in year 30 has like a harder time, generally speaking, to mm -hmm. uh, be as impactful on me. But hey, it still happens. Actually, the, like the the kind of stuff that people, you know, the kind of stuff that the, that you folks have made and so on. It's that's why I still play games is because every year there are, uh, it, there are several games at least that are like really inspiring to me. So. Mm -hmm. Well, what thank you for, you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kareem. Just what makes you not get blown away easier when you get older, I think, is curiosity, the, the absence of curiosity. The, 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 the whole point of having knowledge and gaining experience is the absolute opposite of the curiosity to uh, be surprised and, and be, be blown away. So it's, I think one's own knowledge is the enemy. One owns experience is the enemy, and if you uh, prefer to be uh, uh, exp experimentational and risk taking, and that sort of people tend to get more blown away. It, it, but also, it, you know, sometimes the the time is not uh, touching a nerve. But I think curiosity is a key word there. So it's good that I'm stupid. <laughs> Corey, you're always putting That's yourself down. That's why I'm down. blown away all the time. All the, all the time. Great. No, I love it. And thank you guys for transitioning kind of into modern games because I wanted to take us to act two uh, of our little panel here. We're like running out of time really fast. I can't believe that. Uh, act two is executions, which is not as violent as it sounds. I was just trying to make like a fun rhymey thing with IONS. Uh, but we're, let's talk One about... One of us is going to get executed. I no, absolutely not. Uh, no, the thing that I wanted to talk about were your modern works, things that you guys have been working on recently and the ramifications of that, the stories that you guys have told. Um, you know, you were talking about being blown away by things, but I want to talk about some of your things that have blown me away, the games that you guys have done recently. So maybe, Corey, I, I got to hear from you. You're, you're so quiet today. Have I done anything recently? You have. <laughs> uh, talk about, I mean, I think a lot of people know your work from God of War, but please talk about, yeah. the, you know, any work in, in your field. Oh, wow. Um, uh, no. Nope. Dose of Sparta. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, the, you don't the have to just that list the that. games that you made. I, we can well, that was talk really more about. Uh, I'd say, the, honestly, the, on Sparta, the, the experience that I had with that one, the idea of drilling into a, a story within that universe that was a bit more about uh, uh, the character's relationship with their brother and this kind of constant lifelong uh, blame they had for failing at such a young age and feeling at that young age that they should have been strong enough and smart enough to actually, spoilers, sorry, uh, to, to oh God. prevent something. Oh, 
from happening, uh, which is really fascinating that you played Ultimate at eight years old. I can't imagine myself playing that game at eight years old. I had an older brother. I think that's why I got it. Oh, that's probably what it yeah. is. Yeah, it, it actually, everything good that I know, I think, is because I had a, someone who that's was fantastic. three and a half years older than me. <laughs> I, think I wish I would have had an older brother then. That, that sounds awesome. Corey, I can be your older brother. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, but I want to. I also want to talk to you. I wish. I kind of wish I had my notes, guys. I'm sorry. I had such good questions. Kareem even called them brilliant backstage. He did say brilliant. And now you will never know what the brilliant questions were. <laughs> uh, but I, I have a question. Oh, please. Who came up with the idea? Did you start Bastion and say we're going to make a game where the narration unfolds, or was it like as you were starting yeah. to make the game, someone had a crazy idea? Yeah, it's it's more it's more the latter thing. It it definitely was not there. Uh, the the narration in Bastion, which it, I think for anyone who's Played it is a, is a pretty kind of uh, is an aspect of it that that stands out, uh, and it was not there as like at the inception point of the game. Uh, it started development in like September, and the first attempts at it didn't happen until like January of the following year. Because we always there was always like a narrative ambition to the game, but there was this kind of paradox of like we want it to be this uh, pick up and play really uh, fast action kind of game, but we wanted to have a narrative, but so the narrative can never interrupt the play experience. Well, how are we going to do that? Because most RPGs, you know, stop you for a character interaction or have walls of text and that sort of thing. So all that stuff was off the table. So one day it was like, um, and it was made possible because Amir, our studio director, and the, they all kind of knew each other. Darren, our audio director, and, and Logan, who's the voice of the narrator, they all knew each other from middle school. And it's like, hey man, can you record a few lines for us? We just want to try this thing. And, and he recorded a few lines, and it's like, hey, that's something. The game had no artwork in it at that point, so all you had was this voice, and it immediately sort of mm. made an impression, and we just kind of yeah, ran with it. I always had problem playing those text-heavy game. You know, it, it was just like, you have to stare really deep. I mean, I'm, I'm a slow reader, and I don't speak English well, and I'm a kid in China trying to play these games. It, yeah, I, I really want text to go away. I just wanted to do something. <laughs> You know, and, and you can't see it in my game, but yeah. Yeah, what you did <laughs> I, solved the problem. Is, is that why Journey didn't have like any text at all? No text at all. I hate <laughs> text. <laughs> that was the reason. You always said that it was, you know, a, a way to express and, uh, a deeper and, emotional and, and current. And I failed at writing in English. So That's not, come on. I had Nova. to go to uh, extra classes to make my units back as a foreign student. So I know I'm not good with text. Hmm. What it, now, what is that like for you, uh, as, you know, as you say, as someone that, where English isn't your native language and that you're operating in a space where you want to minimize the amount of text that you, you know, are either using in your work and in your team's work? I mean, is that restraining in, a, in an almost liberating way that you have to, it refines your creativity, or is it you know, a burden that you have to overcome? Yeah, my shortcoming is essentially has to be turning into a strength. Uh, uh, while I was in the film school, my writing class teacher always say, "Hey, you know, you should just give up writing. Give up writing English. Just write Chinese dialogue. You know, it, the stuff you write just does not sound like American people." Jeez, dude. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's harsh. You know, that's my first year here. I don't even speak good English. I'm writing film script for you know <laughs> for my, my American drama, and I realize I don't really understand football, so can't really do Gears of War kind of stuff. Uh, so. And I don't speak How Japanese. Those two connect? Well, I, so I was, you know, when I f first came over here, I, I didn't grow up with consoles. I grew up with PC games. Mm -hmm. And then I saw Madden Football, one of the most popular games. I saw Gears of War. I saw Halo. All three of those characters looked the same. The guy with a big muscle armor and a helmet, <laughs> right? So I was like, what's happening here? Why do American people like it so much, right? So I was just. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell Genova to say all this, just to want to throw that out there. So well, like, it's probably the football culture. I, I went to USC, which is a big football university, but I never went, so I never understood. So I'm like, I can't work on anything based on local culture because I certainly suck at it, and I'm not good at with text. So what can I do? And uh, I looked around. I find Miyazaki's work seems to be popular even uh, in the Western culture. Uh, he's doing just his own thing and very magical and fantastic. And uh, also, in film school, I learned about silent film era. You know, they, they were totally fine telling story without text. So I kind of cheated around you know, that, just making these games. 
That's yeah. amazing. And then it became, and then your work became something that has inspired and connected so many people. I mean, let's let's be honest, real quick. Journey. I mean, how many people have been moved by that? <laughs> Myself included. Kareem, I, Kareem, I want to hear from you again, though. You're, you're, you guys are, you know, Media Molecule is working on dreams right now, which introduces storytelling in a very unusual yeah. way because, you know, as is almost a tradition with you guys, you give a lot of power and a lot of narrative control to your players. Yeah. Uh, how, how does that work? How do you balance that the, out? The, 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 the angle that we do is uh, coming from the personal and journey. We love journey. The, 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 it's a very personal project. The, the, the thing that we, we believed in, in in Media Molecule from the start is to uh, empower and uh, uh, help uh, a lot of the gaming audience and gaming uh, uh, community to express themselves. Because uh, everybody has a story when it comes to their diary, for example, or when people are hanging around a, a dinner table and they have an opinion about stuff and, and they talk about themselves. Everybody has that. Same, uh, so, so the, the, in terms of like how the, our DIY kind of uh, uh, approach to video games, how we wanted to reassemble them and in that process rediscover stories and rediscover how stories are done. Uh, 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 Little Big Planet was our first attempt to uh, charm the, the gaming uh, world and uh, make them contribute to the whole, to the big adventure and the big fantasy. Uh -huh. uh, Dream is the evolution of that, and I, I, I truly believe in prolificness. One of the reasons that uh, a, a musician becomes good, or uh, uh, the reason that we can all talk very well is that we use it all the time. And uh, we, uh, what if you have a medium that allows you to be able to tell a story every day? What if you have a medium that allows you to change your mind a lot and, and refine it? Uh, so our approach in games is that fast, rapid, iterative, empowering system that you can mix disciplines uh, visual disciplines and musical disciplines and fantastical disciplines and see what you get and benefit from the technology and benefit from the, the, the uh, magic of, of, of game engines. Mm -hmm. so, so a story in, in, in media molecule terms can come from making a, a space and putting a few characters in that space and playing with some atmosphere and creating a setting, and suddenly you, you, the spark starts. You start feeling, OK, who are those characters? It's quite practical method. It doesn't come from uh, 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 an approach where we write like a Pixar movie or, and, and, and iterate it and structure it in the uh, uh, classical story format. It's, it's, it's more uh, integrated with the mechanics of games, we, we have people playing with motifs, people making visual uh, elements, and and it all coming together. So our our angle of, of tackling the world of story was by fusing it with the building blocks of making games, and it just elements that and and making the act of making things quite enjoyable and fast. But you guys did come up a huge, very interesting word. In, you know, even Little Big Planet, right? The concept of what the, the user create are the dreams from people, right? Yeah. And now your next game is called Dreams. Yeah, man. And is it continue the meta, you know, word setting like? Yeah, no. Dreams is is so while Little Big Planet was charming and familiar, and it reminds you of your childhood play where you were doing a costume out of felt and cardboard. Mm -hmm. Dreams is more about your personal weirdness. Like when you, when you go to sleep and you, you have a fusion of things that happen. How come I'm in the classroom and I am in my swimsuit? You know, or, uh, or how, how, you know, like the, the... No, wait, I want to hear more examples. <laughs> yeah. Telling examples of weird dreams is bad. <laughs> no, there's your weird. No, it's, 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 really, it's really wonderful that what our imagination can do and how it, we travel from one thing to the other in, in dreams without needing to connect them in, in, in uh, uh, 
logical formats. Like, some writers are famous for that, like Neil Gaiman is a good dreamer. We, we, we wanted dreams to be the equivalent in video games, the equivalent in technology. So not only can you make and express, but you can connect to the next dream and surf between them in a way that feels like act two in a dream, rather than trying to, uh, and we wanted to contribute to innovating in that medium. How can, uh, we, how can we make use of this personal mashup, having lots of personal things, yet having some cohesion? And the dream seemed to be the only angle that can cope with so much difference, yet have some cohesion. Uh, so with, OK, I, I mean, with all the tools I've seen from Twitter, I haven't put my hands on it, right? So you can create very interesting environment. You can create very interesting characters. But usually, story doesn't happen until the character and character has conflict and plot. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think Little Big Planet created all the tools. You can create a character and a word. But how could you provide a tool to create plot? Performance. So performance. Performance. Okay. Performance is the way. When 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 a person is playing with their toys, and you have like the toy and the other toy, and it's like this. Uh, that 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 is a bit of a story. That is not only the act of making the toy inanimately. That is okay. breathing life into it and imagining uh, puppets. When you have a puppet show and you're using the puppets, and we're we, we're borrowing a lot of these analogies. Or a, a, even a musician, you know, with a guitar telling a story, you know. So by making our tools performancy, they lend themselves to storytelling. If you, there's a massive difference between animation and puppeteering. Mm. Uh, animation is the is is a very very beautiful craft of breathing life into a a a, 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 a virtual character. Puppeteering is performing a story, and and and. Uh, live, uh, what you're doing, you're doing right now. And the liveness was our angle. We wanted the act. We didn't want you to spend ages making a set and ages making a character. By the time you, you get lost in the disciplines and the crafts, we wanted you to be able to say, uh, I need, it's like a, a director's chair. You, I need a Western set. I need some characters. And I'm going to uh, uh, start. Uh, performing with them and seeing the, and recording and then looking at it and then perform again and then add some weird music and drop in some unusual thing. Now let's turn it on its head and add. Uh, so if the tool allows you to think like that, then you start delving into the plots, the conflicts, the stories, and so on. Uh, so, so speed of virtual performance was a very big thing for uh, Dream. I'm looking forward to make some dreams in your... Yeah, man, you love it. Yeah, we, we can't wait till you guys get your hands on it. I'm like more... Who's more excited for dreams now? I'm like totally like... <laughs> 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 so, Kareem, I, I appreciate that you brought up performance because I actually want to transition to Corey again because you're still being too quiet, sir. I got to uh, get you talking more. Okay. Performance who, is something that's... Who shows three of these? That's a great question. I have been staring at the whole time. Somebody was like, two? No. I'm glad you're paying three. rapt attention Get me to the ball. discussion. It's fantastic. So one of the things that I want to talk to you about is that performance is kind of an important part, I think, to the God of War series, something that you obviously had your hand in again, as we discussed. Um, it's very visual storytelling. There is, obviously, there's dialogue, there's narrative, there is, you know, uh, uh, what's the I like forgot what a monologue is, but when it's uh, you know the voice spoken, I'm totally botching this here. But anyway, you get you get my drift. You're doing great. I'm following Thank you. Thank you so much. You follow me. I appreciate that. Uh, but it also a lot of the storytelling in God of War, I think, comes from the performance of the actors and from the visuals, even from the sets. And I'm wondering how your team puts together those massive set pieces that also tell a story. They tell a story both in terms of the action set pieces that you build and the actual performance of the characters as well. It's I was hoping you could speak a long, to that. arduous process of trying and throwing out and rebuilding. Uh, you get a core concept, you get a big idea. And I think that big idea then starts to get understood by the collective. And everybody says, oh, that's great. Uh, but I don't like any of it, and I want to try this. Uh, and, and actually, that willingness to keep throwing out an idea when it's not holding 
its own uh, is kind of how we kind of end up with these larger things. There's a, a part in God of War 2 uh, with the collapsing bridge. And I think the direction was, hey, we just need to get from this location to this location. We should use the grapple. And then one of the level designers, Johnny Hawkins, just was like, I'm going to do something crazy. Uh, is that and, how he sounds? Uh, he is, exactly. Okay, perfect, perfect. If anybody who knows Johnny knows that was a great impersonation. Got to do something crazy. Yeah, crazy. Um, so he worked like crazy, uh, like crazy, uh, and uh, put together an amazing thing. And that is a, a big part, of, I think, of the Santa Monica team in general, is that they give so much more than you expect. So it, it's very collaborative then. So yes. that you said that you and originally were just like, oh, we just need to get across this bridge. But this one person is like, oh, no, I can, I can tell a story with this. I can make it much more exciting and kind of bring an action set piece to it. And make it the greatest bridge ever. It was the greatest bridge right. ever. In fact, that phrase really is probably uh, echoes through all of the God of War games. I'm going to make it the greatest bridge ever. Yeah. You know, that, that everything that people take on, they're wanting to make it more and more and more. Uh, so, I, I, you oh. know, you were about to ask something. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, like, I often run into people have this crazy idea and they want to put it in a game, but sometimes, how do you tell them that, you know what, that's great, but, <laughs> but. but. Uh, I, I think it comes down, uh, honestly, to the execution side, too. A lot of people have crazy ideas, but when somebody stays late, puts that idea on the screen and shows you, like, oh, no, this is going to be awesome. Uh, or I, I crush their dreams and say, this is horrible. Uh, Have you used the word horrible with someone's idea before? Be honest. Maybe. It's entirely possible. OK. <laughs> uh, to their face, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Only behind their back. So I, much I read a, a quote from uh, uh, Sid Meier the other day. Somebody had put it on my uh, wall that said that playing games is a series of interesting decisions. Uh, and uh, making games is a series of heartbreaking compromises, uh, which I thought was fantastic because that's so true. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to make games, but it's also an absolutely soul-crushing thing to do it uh, mm -hmm. because it's, you work on these things for so many years. Yeah. You, you lose sight of what you're doing uh, so often, and you have so many people who are so good at what they do wanting to take each piece and make it better. Uh, and it sometimes is like trying to herd kittens, uh, figuring out what piece is going to fit where. Well, speaking of soul crushing, how about Act 3, Aspirations for the Future? <laughs> soul crushing. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, no, obviously, we're, we're a little short on time, so I want to get to kind of, you know, almost the key of all of this, which is where <laughs> is games and storytelling going? And Greg, I haven't heard from you in a while, so I want you, I'm throwing you right out there. Yeah. Where, kind of, you know, off the top of your head, where do you personally see games going and improving in I, this realm and others? I mean, I think the sky's the limit. Like, uh, is something is something Genova said right at the beginning is there, there, or he alluded to this distinction between like world building and, and narrative as these, and when we talk about story, uh, sometimes we're referring to one, sometimes the other and in, in different proportions. And I'm seeing games branching out like really broadly um, in both those directions where there are some games that are extraordinarily strong in terms of their world building and other games kind of are, are doing really uh, fascinating things on the, really focusing on narrative in a way that games in the past haven't done as much. Like look at all the stuff that, you know, you know Telltale just decided we're just gonna, we're just gonna focus on like branching narrative and so on. And that, that's really amazing. Like developers in the past, I don't think have been able to hang their hats on something like that exclu as, as in such a focused way. Um, so I, I love that there's so much exploration happening in so many different directions and that um, uh, people are just, different developers are realizing that some degree of, of what we call storytelling here, you know, whether it's the world building or, or the more traditional narrative, some amount of that um, applied thoughtfully to what they're working on is, is chances are it's gonna like enhance the game. The game may as well say something, be about something, um, it just stands a higher chance of leaving an impact on the player in like a positive way. That's the reason uh, Supergiant games have narrative in them. It's not necessarily for its own sake because, oh, there, there's a story we have to get out. Like for us, it started from almost like a pragmatic place of like, hey, we're seven people making an action RPG and our favorite action RPG is like Diablo 2, but we're not gonna 
like we're not going to make a game with nine character classes and like 10,000 weapons and and you know eight player multiplayer and so on. So we don't have any of the features that are like necessary traditionally to making a good game in this format. Uh, so all we can do is sort of contextualize what we're not doing. So we're going to make a game about one character and so on. We we may as well at least try to make that stuff make sense. And so I, I think other games that uh, think about how narrative could enhance what they're doing have been doing um, really great things. And sometimes these games come from just one individual. There's a game called Papers, Please from a couple of years ago is just not mind blowing. Yep. Um, and that's an incredibly strong narrative game, I think, even though it's not like a traditional story. It's just like incredibly powerful uh, world building and, and quite interesting, you know, traditional narrative content as well. So I love that people are playing with it and recognizing uh, that it's powerful, but I also am like, you know, I brought up Ultima, whatever. I think I also feel that games have been doing this stuff all along. It's, it's like a little bit more trendy now. More people realize that there's something to this. Um, and I'm glad for that because I love games that uh, attempt interesting things on that front. Absolutely. I feel like it's interesting that we can maybe not tell stories at people. And, and, and it's really a lot more, it seems to be evolving a lot more in that inviting them in to the story, mm -hmm. the idea of, of letting it get a little messy. Maybe everything's not perfect uh, because uh, life isn't perfect. So, so I can summarize that with three trends. So first, participatory storytelling. I mean, you play the game, you influence the story. <laughs> Second is story streaming. You know, if, if you, I mean, these days we just stream sports, but sports is a little narrative as well. But mm. I think maybe in the future games, the story gets more interesting you know, and everybody has a different version and someone will have a crazy, amazing version of a story. A lot of people want to watch that. Mm. Uh, maybe that will come from dreams. Uh, and, uh, you know, those, those are what I can see right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we are working on with Journey and our new game is... What is that? Uh, can't talk about it, but uh, man, oh man, I tried. Corey, but, but it's we like, talked about this back. So like <laughs> most of the game you are playing alone. Right, and your your narrative is completely based on your choice. Uh, but if you start playing game with other people in the same environment, they are this chaos factor, which you will never get the same story the next time. Um, how do we handle a narrative structure and still mo touch you when there's so much chaos? Um, and so that's kind of like the current thing. But I always feel about in the future the most interesting about narrative. Uh, my pop college professor, uh, Chris Swain, used to say, video game is still in the era of the silent film because the equivalent of sound and words are not just sound of the current video game, but the ear of our AI system to understand what we are saying. Imagine you're playing a game not just pressing buttons, you're actually talking to the game. You know, like you see the movie Her, right? Mm. I mean, once the the game can understand you to a much greater extent, way more high resolution than 16 buttons. Mm. The interaction between you and the game could be so much more uh, emotional and social that it's like if you can talk to the character, what is, what is this feeling going to be like? It's good, you know, like Peter Molyneux showed something called Project Milo, which spurred my thinking about that, but we still don't have the technology ready yet. But I look forward to that future, mm. you know? Karim, did you have anything you wanted yeah, to add? The, the, you know, talking about technology, the, the, the thing that uh, really needs to evolve to progress and propel stories to the next place is how long it takes to make games. Like an incredible game like God of War and uh, the epic Greek mythology like in the League of like, Odyssey. And it's, uh, uh, it takes years and heartache and development. While it takes... Uh, uh, a minute or a few, uh, an hour to make a song. You bring a guitar and you, you write, yeah, uh, you know, if you are uh, able to do that. But it's a medium that has a sketching mentality. Uh, you can uh, uh, sketch your thoughts, you can broad stroke it, you can judge it, you can play it to people. In fact, you can do that so well that people do that concerts uh, with that medium. So the, the, the game is slow very, very slow. Store, uh, game development is very slow and very expensive. So that's a problem. 
the, the, uh, and by uh, having, uh, revisiting those concepts technologically to allow the medium to have its more fast, if you have an idea, you should be able to see it in one day, completely. And not only white box, crappy looking, like amazing, beautiful, it's the same like a sketch from Rubens or Michelangelo, it is something that you can buy. It's a, you know, a game sketch, a sketch of a game with the music, the, the, the narrative, the integration with the mechanics, that stuff needs to get faster. And then hybrid skills will emerge because uh, narrative is still borrowing a lot from the, its older uh, uh, ancestors, uh, the, 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 the old uh, theater and books and comics and this. But the game narrative, the, the, the marriage with the game mechanics, that's the difficult one. That's always the problem. You, you've got beautiful, deep ideas, and then you've got a mechanic of a ball bouncing or, or you, you, you have uh, uh, and make that work, you know. So, so the, the marriage of the mechanics, the interaction with the feeling and the depths of the world will develop as well when we have hybrid skills, mm -hmm. new talents, that are a mix of a, a, a level designer and a writer and an artist and an animator fusing to create a new creature uh, who tells story in video game vocabulary and able to present it and iterate on it unpreciously. Is this what you guys are trying to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope uh, you guys need unity. We, uh, unfortunately, that real red clock there says zero. Gentlemen, we are all out of time. Can, can we have a huge round of applause for the developers up here? Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for being here and for coming here. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And you all have time to go to the uh, kind of funny meet and greet. Look at that. Perfect. Anyway, thank you, everyone, for coming here. I appreciate it. I hope you stick around more uh, you know, today and tomorrow. And uh, we will see you at PlayStation Experience later on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. PlayStation.